All right, shall we, uh, shall we get started? Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome along to, I guess, what is the final research roundup of uh, this, this semester. Um, it doesn't seem long since, uh, since we were welcoming students back on campus, but we're, um, we're almost at the end of the semester. Um, so we've been covering a, a number of topics this, uh, this year. And um, as we were planning out, out our meeting for, uh, for December, we realized we hadn't really focused um, very much on post-award. And uh, that's such a, a crucial aspect of, uh, of what we do um, uh, as faculty and, uh, and in the research office here. And um, so we thought it would be great to devote a session um, to getting into the nuts and bolts of what really happens and uh, the expectations and the, uh, the services that are available to you once your um, grant is funded. Uh, and so, it's, so here to, uh, to lead us through that today, we have, uh, we have our team from the Eberly Expert Business Office uh, led by Tina Lavelle, who serves as the Associate Dean for Financial Planning and Management, um, Clifton Colbank, who's the Interim Chief Business Office uh, Planning Officer, um, Erica Longenecker uh, and Shelby McClure, who both um, serve as post-award grants management managers, and um, Mickey uh, McIntosh, who serves as a budget analyst. Uh, I think I've got everyone from, oh, and Melissa Jenkins is here as, as well. Sorry, Melissa, I, I, I missed you as well. So, um, so I think uh, Erica and Shelby are going to be doing much of the presentation, but at this point, I'd like to hand it off uh, uh, to Tina or Clifton, whoever wants to uh, to lead in. So thanks again for, for doing this, guys. Really appreciate it. Sure, I'll, I'll go ahead and take it. Thank you, um, Dr. Warmer. And uh, thanks to everybody who's joining us today. And I am going to just turn off my video so that it's um, make sure that that everything kind of matches up when we go through this. Um, but um, we're going to go over today kind of the post award grant management. And um, I guess if you have questions, you can certainly uh, put those in the chat feature and we'll monitor that. But we'll also have a question and answer session at the end. And um, if you could also maybe mute your mics if you haven't already done so, that would be appreciated. Uh, we were asked to uh, develop a presentation to review post-award grant management. And this is really the point at which your, your grant proposal was selected for funding. And our Office of Sponsored Programs has worked with the sponsor to get the grant established. The, the grant accounts are created, and you're really ready to start working on the grant. Um, today's presentation was more geared toward folks who may be new to this process. Um, from a faculty standpoint, it can also be from a staff standpoint. I know we have a few staff who are joining us today. But it's also a good refresher for faculty who may have a little bit more experience with, with grants and grant management. Uh, as we were preparing the presentation um, to try to come up with the topics that we wanted to discuss, it was pretty clear we could easily make this an all day workshop when we were talking about grant management, post award grant management, uh, instead of just a 30 minute presentation. Um, it would be almost impossible to address every scenario uh, that could, could come up during uh, the life of a grant. But what we've done here is we've selected a few of the common items or common aspects of post-award grant management. And even with these, not all of them will apply to every award. So Shelby, if you can pull up the presentation. Um, can you not see it? I do not see it. Share my screen. Okay, we're going to go to the next slide. Okay, some of the things we are going to review today uh, is the award notification and budget. And that's really the, the initial notification that you'll receive. And we're just going to touch, touch on what that notification tells you and what you should do with that information. Uh, we're also going to be looking at personnel purchasing. More than likely, once you have your award, 
set up, you're going to need to either hire students, maybe recruit for personnel. You're going to want to go buy supplies, maybe purchase equipment, maybe travel. And we're going to touch a little bit on that today. Uh, we're also going to look at subcontracts and sub awards. And again, this is one of those items that probably doesn't apply to every grant award, but, it, but it's worth reviewing. We're going to review what each is and how to establish each. We're also going to look at cost share. Again, this is something that probably doesn't apply to every grant. Well, we know it doesn't apply to every grant, but if it does, we need to understand it and what and how to manage it. We're also going to look at project management. And this is, you know, during the life of this award, you need, might need to make adjustments to the project. You might need to modify the budget. Your key personnel might change. You might need to request a no-cost extension. So we're going to touch briefly on how you go about making those requests. And then, of course, the last thing we want to talk about is the uh, closeout of an award. Uh, it's a very important step uh, in, the, in the management of your award. And we'll just touch on how to plan and how to finalize the award as it gets to its expiration. Next slide. Uh, before we get into the actual presentation, though, we kind of wanted to let you know that you're not in this alone. Uh, as the PI, as the fact member, you're responsible for the actual management of the award, but there's plenty of resources out there to help you as you go through this process. Uh, you have resources in your department. And that could be your department chair. You've got a lot of great staff in your departments, all of which you can refer to, and they are all there to help. Uh, at the college level, we, of course, have the pre-award uh, office, which is uh, Dr. Lorimer, Erica, and Leah. But then, of course, you have the post-award, uh, which would be Shelby and Erica and myself. And then we have the payroll uh, employees, Melissa and Mickey, that are going to help you through the process of getting people hired. And then we have university resources. This is the Office of Sponsored Programs. They're the ones that um, review and submit grant proposals. They negotiate and accept and initiate the awards. And of course, we also have the Sponsored Research Accounting Unit at the university level. And they are the ones that um, do a lot of the financial administration of the, of the sponsored award, or sponsored activity. Uh, they also do the invoicing, the billing, the financial reporting, the physical oversight and compliance, auditing, and they will be the ones that will be involved with the closeout of the award. If you want to get the next slide. Uh, this, this is just a quick list of all the departments and the uh, key staff members in each department. It also has the key business office personnel as well. We've assigned personnel to each of the departments to review grants and to review payroll, but that doesn't mean that you can reach out to any of us if you have questions. Um, and at the end of the presentation, we'll have all of our contact information, so you'll have that as well. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Shelby uh, to start the presentation. Okay. So once your grant is funded, the first thing you'll get is an award notification. So when a PI reviews or receives a new grant, they'll receive an email that contains the green sheet. So what is a green sheet? A green sheet is simply the award notification. Um, we often refer it to refer to it as a green sheet because it was printed on green paper back in the day. Um, so once you receive the green sheet, you should check the details of the grant. Is your grant set up as expected? Um, some things to review is the expenditure organization. Um, it should be your home org. And then if you have co-eyes that are assisting with research and has a separate budget, are there separate tasks established? Um, and then simply, is your budget um, as expected overall? And then after you review the details of your green sheet and you're comfortable with everything, um, how to tell whether your Poeta is a state or research grant. The letter at the end of an award indicates whether it's state or research. So an R would be for a research corp, W is for a state grant. And then we provided the image off to the right, um, which shows an example of a Poeta and a GL. And a, a Poeta is an acronym. It stands for Project Organization Expenditure Type Task and Award. And GL is for gen General Ledger. So it shows the difference between the funding string segments and the order of the segments. So as you can see, a POETA has five segments. 
which each one kind of represents a question that a PI could ask themselves, where a project would be, what research am I doing? Task would be, what part of the project am I doing? Award is, who's paying me? Expenditure type is, what kind of expenditure? And an organization is, what part of the university? Um, so Puerto will have the expenditure type and org spelled out in words. It's kind of an easy way to distinguish. Whereas a GL has six segments, and it represents the same information as a Boeta, but in a different order. So any non-grant GL will have all nines as the project number. That kind of is another easy way to identify that. And then um, each um, grant comes with sponsored award documents. Um, and some sponsor award documents um, are the terms and conditions, project budget, budget justification, and a sponsor agreement, just to name a few. And the PI should ensure compliance with the terms and conditions of their award throughout the life of their grant. Um, and each agency has different terms and conditions. And um, myself and Erica are always here to assist with reviewing the terms and conditions if the PI has any questions or concerns. And then the PI should be aware of, of the federal and agency regulations and requirements. So there are different costs that may require prior approval, such as pre-award costs, equipment, and subcontracts. Um, and there could be certain budget limitations that they could be they need to be aware of. And each sponsor will have deadlines that the PI should also stay in compliance with. So at that, I'll hand this over to Melissa to talk about hiring and personnel. So most work awards will include salaries in the budget, whether it is benefit eligible students or temporary workers. Our next slide here is on personnel hiring and support. And the first bullet asks, do you need to hire? So if you need to hire postdoctoral researchers, you will contact Eberly's HR partner. And Jessica Zhang is currently Eberly's human resource partner. She is also the contact when requesting a Mountaineer temp. Mountaineer temp is just a temporary position with a limited time frame to work. Um, and we also are asking the question, you know, are you supporting students? So maybe you included a graduate research assistant or an hourly student to work in your lab. When hiring students, please work with your department staff to complete a payroll request form. No matter the category in which you hire, the individual must process for payroll before beginning work. In order to encumber salaries, a payroll request form must be submitted to identify the employee, the funding source, and the time period. This includes payment for faculty summer salary. So if you budgeted summer salary, don't forget to pay yourself. Work with your administrative staff um, to get the request submitted. If you do pay anyone from a grant, you need to be aware that you will also have to submit an effort report. So just to give you a broad overview, an effort report is a federal requirement. Um, and if you're interested in finding out all about that, you can follow the link here on the slide. But essentially what it is, is a document that shows that we spent the money the way that we agreed to spend it. It's a review of the last six months of pay and you sign it if all went according to plan. Um, if it didn't go according to plan, you need to let us know immediately, either Shelby or myself, and we'll work with you to help get that corrected so that you can sign a revised effort report. Uh, effort reports are the university's legal record uh, for how it spends the sponsoring agency's money on salaries. So it's really a document that we like to have on hand for audit requests so that we can support the fact that everything went according to plan on the award. So you're just reviewing and certifying that the percent effort that the person was paid is actually um, reflective of the amount of effort that they put on the award and also that that meets the requirements of the award itself. And as with every other topic, if you have any questions about this, please ask. It, um, it does come up often, so don't be afraid to express any questions or concerns that you have. The other thing that's important on awards on the next slide is the expenditure processing. Um, so there are several ways that you can purchase things at WVU, and you need to be familiar with the systems that WVU uses to purchase things. So the first would be Mountaineer Marketplace. Um, and Mountaineer Marketplace is the platform that you're going to use to purchase all of your, um, your supplies and equipment. So um, 
if if you have any questions about that, um, well, I'll get to that in a second. I'm sorry. Um, Chrome River is also the platform that you would use if you um, need to be reimbursed for anything. So if you have any travel expenses or gas expense mileage, things like that, or if you use your P card to purchase anything. So um, if you use your P card to purchase anything, then that would also have to be reconciled through Chrome River. So obviously, in order to use your P card for anything, you would need to have one. If you need to procure a P card, you do that through Mountaineer Marketplace. And the important thing to remember with your P card is that you need to have the P card that aligns with the type of award that you have. So if you have a state award, you need a state P card. And if you have a research award, you need a research P card. Um, and shared services is a resource that's available to help you with all of this. So um, essentially what shared services is, is an online platform for the faculty and staff to submit and track their service requests, access frequently asked questions and share information. So there's a wealth of resources that can be obtained through shared services. And if you cannot find the answer through shared services, they will also help you get the answers that you need. Once you've gotten to the point where you know how to, to process transactions um, and, and things start posting to your award, you also want to make sure that you review those transactions to verify that they are allowable, allocable, and reasonable and are received or performed within the project period. So um, if your award ends on December 31st of this year, all of your goods or services must be performed or received before December 31st. Um, and then also just keep in mind that there are some purchases that will um, be subject to a, an additional layer of scrutiny. And some of those purchases are things like equipment, foreign travel, and subcontracts. And we will touch on some of these subjects in depth um, in a later slides. But if you have anything that seems slightly out of the ordinary on an award, please do not hesitate to ask. It's always a lot easier for us if we are aware that a purchase is coming and can get approval so that your transaction can actually process much more smoothly. Um, and then the last, the last thing with your expenditure processing, which I did touch on a little bit already, is that you do need to make sure that all of your expenses, including any cost transfers, are processed in a timely fashion. So not only do you not want to be rushing transactions through at the end of the award, you also don't want to wait a year before transferring something off of your overhead onto the award. Um, you want to make sure that if you accidentally put something on it uh, on another funding string and it belongs on your award, that as soon as you realize that that happens, that you make sure to, to initiate the transfer. And again, Shelby and I are, are here to help you get that stuff done as quickly as possible. So please do not be afraid to use our resources. Okay, so capital equipment, as Erica mentioned, is something that um, may need special approval um, to get a purchase on your grant, but so equipment must be approved during the proposal stage um, by the sponsor, but so what is capital equipment? Um, it's any equipment item over 5,000 with a useful life in excess of one year. When the item meets the capital equipment definition, it has to be tagged and documented by the department and property administration. And there is also fabricated equipment, which is when components are combined into one identifiable unit. The finished product also has to be tagged and documented by the department and property administration if it is over 5,000 and has a useful life of more than one year. Um, so again, if equipment was not budgeted and you need to purchase equipment, please reach out to us as equipment may require prior approval. It's easier to ask ahead of time and be proactive than reactive. Um, and if you're wanting to dispose of any property, also please reach out to your chair and college and we can help ensure the disposal process is in accordance with the policies and procedures. Um, if you were to have any questions about purchasing or disposing of property, like always reach out to us, um, mainly because property administration conducts an asset audit every two years. And this requires the department to identify and locate tagged equipment. And whether the item is found or not found, the college has to report on all tagged items. And we continuously have to follow up to find those um, tagged items. And then another item that requires 
that may require approval is a subcontractor or a subaward. So not every grant will have a subcontractor or subaward, but if your grant does um, and you're not sure whether it's a subcontractor or subaward, um, we can help identify that. So a subaward would transfer a portion of programmatic work to a subrecipient, um, which is usually another institution or organization. So this is, um, excuse me, this would be budgeted into your grant and approved by your sponsor ahead of time. And the subrecipient is required to perform the agreed upon programmatic work, where a subcontract or a service agreement in simple terms is anything that does not meet the definition of a subaward. And if you're still unsure, reach out to us and we can help make that distinction. We can also work with PCPS to uh, make that distinction. And PCPS 10, well, and shared services tend to help set up subcontracts and service agreements. Um, so when to initiate or modify a subaward, um, subawards are initiated and modified at OSP once they're approved by the sponsor. So if you were to need, if you need to modify your subaward due to funding changes, the change in scope of work, et cetera, we'll have to reach out to OSP because um, once a subaward is set up at their level, they're the only ones that can make any modifications to it. And you can reach out to them by phone or email which are provided on the link below. But like many things, OSP can, um, is a great asset if you have any questions about a subcontract or a subaward. There are a few other reasons why you might need to contact OSP or the sponsor. And honestly, um, Shelby and I don't mind being your point of contact for this. So before I even get into why you would contact OSP, it's totally fine to just reach out to one of us and let us do all the legwork for you um, because we do know who to contact and do know what needs to be done to get things done. Um, but these are some of the scenarios in which you would need to contact OSP um, and or your sponsor. Um, the first is for a budget modification. Um, and again, Shelby and I are, are pretty um, well versed in budget modification. So we'll be happy to submit this on your behalf. All you need to do is let us know what it is that your aims are with the goal or the goals are with the budget modification. And then Shelby and I will work together to put that together in a format that, um, that it, is agreeable to OSP and will submit it on your behalf and keep you informed of when it's processed. Um, OSP um, also will help you with your no cost extensions. Um, and there are some instances when you'll need to reach out to the sponsor in order to obtain one. And then also signif significant changes to product status. So any changes to key personnel, changes in effort or changes in scope are, um, are definitely things that need OSP needs to be notified and they will let us know whether or not the sponsor also needs to be notified. And then the last thing that, um, well, the last thing that I'll talk about here that you might encounter on an award is also the cost share. So cost shares are already negotiated and set up by the time that the award is established. Um, so your cost share will be set up on a separate task and award so that you can monitor the expenses on your monthly reports, which we'll get into in a moment. Um, and most cost share awards start with the letter C, so they're easy to identify. Cost shares occur when WVU contributes to a project and the support is included in the proposal budget or award. So that's important. You would see this at the onset of the award. Um, they're only required or they're only provided when required by the sponsor um, and they need to be verifiable, necessary and reasonable on the award in order for WVU to agree to it. So review of fin financial activities. Um, it's the PI's responsibility to review all financial tra transactions that are expended on their grants. Um, to assist with this, a PI receives a monthly grant report, which allows them to review the expenditures on a monthly basis. And this helps keep us in compliance. Um, so reviewing the monthly report can also assist with identifying any expenditures that were posted in error and need to be corrected. And if you find any expenditures that are posted in error, please reach out to your departmental staff and or um, Erica and myself, and we will work with you to get those to get the errors corrected. Because um, cost transfers need to be completed in a timely fashion. We try to make cost transfers within 90 days of the expenditure item date. 
And we do know there are some scenarios where that may not um, fit within the 90 days, but we try to keep it to that. And then um, as always, all expenditures must be allowable, applicable, and reasonable. So then a, an example of a monthly grant report that we send out would have two tabs. So this um, screen that you're looking at now is the EBSR, which is the expenditure budget summary report, which this is the first tab of your monthly report. All active and expired but not yet closed grants are in this tab. And we're reviewing the budget summary tab. Please make sure you are understanding what you, what you are reviewing. So you'll see the project task award and task organization for each grant along with the award full name and agency to help identify the grant. Um, Cause Erica and myself may refer to your grant by the award number, but most PIs know their grants by um, the, award, the award name. So you would then see the current budget off to the right. And that's how your budget was set up initially at OSP and um, any budget modifications that Eric and I submit would also be reflected here. Your budget would change based on the, mod, um, the modification. The encumbrance column shows any salaries that have been encumbered and will be paid out in the future. Any orders in marketplace that have, been, have not been received and or invoiced will show as an encumbrance. And any subcontracts or subawards will be encumbered until they are invoiced. The next column is the current month expenditures, which are the expenditures that were expended during that month. And these are the expenses that show on the second tab. And then um, the expenditures to date column is a sum of all the expenditures expended during the life of your grant thus far. And the last column is the unobligated balance. And this column tells you what the balance remaining is in each of the expenditure categories in the overall unobligated balance remaining in your task. So this is showing you what is left that you have to work with. And then the second tab is the expenditure budget detail report. Um, so this shows you the expenditure details for each expense expended on your grant. And when reviewing this, you want to ensure all expenditures are accurate and allowable on your awards. So this tab shows similar grant information as the first one, but I wanna bring your attention to the task organization and the expenditure organization to the left. The task organization is assigned by OSP and the expenditure organization should match the task org. Um, the expenditure org is what drives the return to FNA, which we will touch upon later, but the expenditure org is what is keyed when making each purchase or when salary is applied. So making sure that that is the correct expenditure org is very important. And then when reviewing the expenditures, you wanna make sure any salaries that are expended on your award should be paid on your award. And also be looking for any salaries that are missing. If there are missing salaries, let us know. We'll work with you to get those salaries applied to your grant. The f and and fringe are automatically charged and f and is charged on the total modified direct costs. And fringe is expended when salary is expended. Um, and sometimes I get asked this, fringe follows where the salary is being paid. You can't pay fringe on a different funding string. So salary goes, or fringe goes where salary goes. And any general expense and travel expenses are expended when they're invoiced and paid. So when reviewing general expense or travel expenses, you just wanna make sure those are actually um, your expenses, you're expecting them to be there. Um, so removing, reviewing your monthly grant report on a monthly basis helps us stay in compliance and can create an easy and clean closeout process for the grant, which is better for all of us in the end. It's worth emphasizing again that it does make your project close out much easier if you're reviewing your transactions as the grant proceeds, um, rather than having to go through all of those transactions with a fine tooth glue at the end. So please do take time to look at your monthly reports.
Um, when it is time for project closeout, we ask that you start looking at your award at least 90 days before the end, end date. Um, and keep in mind that every, um, every good that has to be received prior to the end date of your award and all salaries have to be from the period of your award. You cannot have anything post with the date after your award ends or we will have to move it. Um, you do have 30 days after the award ends to finalize your transaction. So if you do have something that was received prior to the end date of your award, but you forgot to receive it, maybe you should have received it on the 29th and you didn't think of it till the 1st, you can still do that. You just have to make sure that you receive it for the 29th. So um, just make sure that you pay attention to the end date of your award and that you're following along closely with that. And Shelby and I are happy to be a resource for you in this instance, um, we can print out real time reports for you that let you know what your transactions are as of that day, so we can be very helpful. Uh, and then also just re remember that you may be required to do some final reporting. Um, we do ask that all financial reports are handled by the sponsored research accounting group, but the final project reports are the PI's responsibility. So um, please pay attention to any notices that you receive from OSP. They will, um, or sorry, sponsored research accounting, they will remind you that your reports are due. And then um, there are some other things that you'll also want to uh, cover uh, or consider on your award. Um, these are probably topics that deserve their own presentation, but I will just touch on them briefly. Um, in addition to those final reports, some awards do require interim reports. So um, if you're familiar with the terms and conditions of your award, you'll be looking for this. Um, but please make sure you pay attention to any reminders that you might receive. Uh, you don't want to be out of compliance with your reports. Um, then, as Shelby mentioned, there is you know, no return to FNA on awards. So any awards that are charged FNA get a portion of that back, uh, which is then distributed in part to the department and to the PI twice a year. And that is driven by that expenditure org. So again, please make sure that you charge it properly. And if you do find that you've made a mistake, it's easy to correct. Um, then there's also participant support versus human subject payments. And just to give you a very brief overview, participant support provides services or training and has a separate task on your award. Human subject payments are part of the research and are lumped into the main award and budgeted under general expenses. And then lastly, the incentive uh, salary policy. You can follow the link included on the slide there to find out more about it. But essentially just be aware that there it does exist um, and it relates to additional effort on a particular grant within that academic year. Um, so if you have any questions about that or any of these subjects, please make sure to ask, um, which actually um, pretty much wraps us up. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to ask us now or at any time. And thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thanks very much, everybody. Um, we have um, plenty of time for questions. Um, really appreciate all of this information and you know, it really underscores the breadth of the services that you offer. So Leah's got going to be um, um, posting some of these in the chat and she asks um, if, if people can share common mistakes people make with their proposals that cause problems post-award. Shelby or Erica, would you like to take one of those? Because I'm sure you get a chance to uh, see some of those if, if nobody else has any. Wants well, to chime I, in. I think this is a perfect um, time to chime in for the services of our pre-award team. <laughs> because the biggest problems that I see, honestly, are the ones where they where where our PIs are not using our pre-award team, where they aren't taking advantage of the expertise that's there um, right at their fingertips. And then, you know, they miss some, some common errors that Erica and Leah are, are well-versed in and can help you avoid. Yeah, I agree with Erica. Um, our pre-award team is great. And, um, I mean, I feel like they think of all the things that maybe we don't think about on, um, the pre-award side, obviously. Uh, I feel like the common mistakes are maybe just under budgeting somewhere or maybe not requesting um, an equipment budget if need be. Um, travel, sometimes they under budget their travel. Just some of the, th I think that is just more of what we see and then we end up having to 
request approval for it. Can you stop sharing screen so we can see the other participants? Yes. Thank you. Um, another question um, that Lee has posted is um, if uh, if one or more of you can talk about um, the process of transferring funds. We, we do often end up with issues about transferring funds, and I'm sure Clifton and Shelby will have a lot to add with this particular particular subject, but um, we run into a lot of trouble with people wanting to do transfers like from grant to grant, which we really don't like to see. It's not a good idea to take a, an expense from one grant and put it on another one. Um, so you really need to plan your expenses a little bit more carefully so that you don't find yourself in that situation. And we also have had some issues recently with PIs wanting to move um, costs far after the award has ended. So beyond that 30 days, um, the 30 day window when an award is over, we've had PIs trying to make transfers where they realized all of a sudden that they forgot to post something or, or they'd never followed up on an invoice that they should have received, those type of things. So we really try not to do transfers outside of that 30 days after the award has ended. Erica, can I clarify just one thing? When you mentioned uh, putting expenditures on one grant and moving them to another. Are you referring to when one grant isn't here yet, but you know it's coming, so you post it just to keep it parked somewhere and then move it? Or are you suggesting a different scenario? The scenario that I was thinking of specifically was what happens when a grant is overspent at the end and the PI needs to move their expenses somewhere. A lot of them will try to move them to another award. Um, I think the scenario that you described, Tina, is also not ad advisable, <laughs> but I haven't seen that one too too often because we usually catch that kind of scenario and tell them not to do it. Yeah, we have had um, that we have had that scenario come up where they want to put it on a grant that may be similar research, but it's separate. So um, we also we often turn them down, and we do have a research. Um, GL that we can use as a holding um, that we've used for those types of scenarios or if, um, a credit's coming in, then we like to move it off the grant onto a research GL and put that credit there. It makes for a cleaner audit, which is um, a big deal. Um, but yeah, as Erica had said, we try not to move an expense from one grant to another because of over obligation, it's a, it's a red flag. And um, let me just comment about those red flags. We um, are currently undergoing an audit and um, it requires a significant amount of effort on everybody's part to address questions. So it's, it, it's really in our best interest to make these folks, make, make our accounts clean. I mean, keep them clean and keep them as compliant as possible. It doesn't mean that you can't move things, but when these red flags occur, we then ha have to invest more effort later. You do too. So the point is, if we ask questions first and get um, and find alternate ways to manage issues as they come up, it might help us in the long run as well. Can we talk a little bit more about effort? Often when people are developing proposals, you know, we add summer salary on, you know, the grant proposal budgets. Um, sometimes people ask about academic year effort. So when is it appropriate for people to request summer salary? And when should they maybe think about the faculty incentive program um, for effort during the academic year? I can take that, Shelby, if you'd like. It, the, when is the effort being expended? We should always pay when we're doing the work. And that is no matter what the source of funding. Now, during the academic year, that's when incentive would apply. So if you replace your academic salary with grant funds, then you are eligible, as long as you've maintained all of your other duties and responsibilities and there are no course releases, you can apply for 
the incentive salary program. In the summer, we pay in the summer if efforts being expended in the summer. So it's really important because remember, you're signing an effort report that is that spans differing time frames. So you have to you're verifying to the federal government that you were paid during the time the effort was expended. Thanks, Tina. Um, yeah, a couple of other questions that are coming through. Um, just a general one, when and how often um, would you advise faculty to meet with you? I guess that can vary quite a lot, but if you could give some general advice, that would be helpful. I think they should really meet with us when they when they think they need us, and that would really be any time. Um, if they have concerns about their award or if they want to review their expenditures, I do think particularly in the last 90 days of the award, we would like to meet with them regularly, um, at least every other week. We want to have some sort mm -hmm. of contact. Um, I, th I think, I don't know if Shelby feels differently than that, but I, I would think that's pretty good. No, I, I agree with Erica. I think it varies also depending on um, if the faculty has been in the university and they're like well-versed in um, the whole life of the grant and the closeout process, that can also um, depend on how much assistance they may need. Um, but definitely during the last like 90 days to make sure that we're preparing for closeout properly is a really important time. Um, but they're free to request a meeting with us anytime. We're always available to meet with faculty or staff if they have any questions. Is there any benefit to faculty meeting with you upon receipt of the award so you can walk through what it is that will be budgeted and answer questions? I mean, obviously they're welcome to, but is there any benefit to starting out with a meeting together? Yes, definitely. I mean, a lot of, especially if you're a new PI, um, if you're established, it might not be as necessary, but for brand new PIs, it's really very important. They have a lot of questions about how to purchase things and, you know, what happens if they go outside of their budget, that type of thing. Uh, if there's anything strange about the award or not strange, but outside of the norm, um, those are things that we would want to be able to help them with and can answer any questions. And it, again, it's one of those things where we probably don't know the answer to everything they're going to ask us, but we do know how to get answers. So please feel free to direct your questions in our direction. Thank you and very I much. Um, before I forget, we've got a, we've got time for a question or two more. Um, but before I forget, there's a um, a link to the survey form in the chat there if uh, people get a chance to just go in there and, uh, and fill it out to give us some feedback and suggestions for future roundups that would be great. Um, one, uh, one question that's come through is uh, what should faculty do if they think something is wrong on their report? They should definitely tell us <laughs> immediately. <laughs> yes. It does happen. Um, yeah. I, I had one last month where somebody recognized that there was payroll for a person they didn't know on their award. So please look at these. You know, it's it's really easy to just have a keying error and and things can go out of whack easily. So look at them every single month and let us know right away if you see something. Right. And uh, let me just follow up with that briefly. In the system within which our financial transactions occur, as long as the number is in the system, the system will take it. So when Erica refers to a keying error, it could be at any point in the transaction. So it is very important to watch it all the way through. OK, any, um, any other last questions? or? Comments? Another question was posted. Oh, thank you. Yes, it just popped in. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, shared services and how you work with them? So shared services is the transactional portion of our department of, of, of our services. If if you need to have something entered, shared services is the place that is going to do the entry. 
Um, and so they can answer a lot of questions about the, the detail with, with some purchases because things that can get complicated depending on what you need to do. Can you give us an example of how to interact with them? So I understand there's a vanity email account, so it's a, an email account that's something like shared services at mail that everybody's ready to use. And you can send an email with an attachment that might say something like, pay this honorarium or pay this vendor. Or if this is not something that you keep, I, how, do you communicate with them in a way um, that, that differently than you would through Mountain Air Marketplace? That's my question. So everything that you can key into Mountain Air Marketplace, we do ourselves. But on what circumstances do shared services, can shared services help? I think the question uh, I was trying to post was um, if if people are concerned about payments not coming through or uh, delay in payment, is that something you can assist them with working with shared services or should they contact shared services directly? A lot of them contact me directly and, and that's because the PIs don't need to know the, the detail about how to get in touch with every single person that they need. That's really what I'm here for. So I think most of them do take the questions directly to me. Uh, and if I don't know the answer, I, I would search for the answer. Um, and the department li liaisons can work this way too. I mean, I know that a lot of them are a resource, um, are a valuable resource for their PIs and do know a lot of the ins and outs of how to do these things as well. Very good. Um, any other? Any other comments? I think we're uh, we're running up uh, on on time. Yeah, thanks everybody for joining, and um, we'll be um, we'll be doing some more roundups in the in the new year. Uh, so please take a moment to to give us some suggestions if you if you if you can on the form. Um, I really want want to thank Tina, Clifton, and all the the team for all the work they do behind the scenes. You know, a lot of this is. A lot of sort of uh, thankless tasks that go on, and they, they really make sure that the, the money flows in the right directions. And it's it's just a huge part of uh, the research and scholarship that gets done here. So thank you on behalf of everyone for for what you do. Okay, um, well um, I think we'll uh, we'll call it a day there. Thanks all.